Okay, so, uh, so today for the graduate session, we have uh, <coughs> three uh, different auditory things to sort of finish up on some of the advanced, uh, advanced auditory things. Uh, a little bit of a grab bag. So we'll first talk about um, <coughs> sort of trying to understand, you know, you, you, you see some psychological or f phonetic phenomenon and, and try to sort of understand, you know, understand at what level to explain it at. It's a little bit of a philosophy of science uh, thing, but it's important for sort of understanding, you know, you, you have information from different levels of organization and uh, trying to understand, like, you know, where should we, you know, where should we focus on our, our understanding of the phenomenon? And then I'll talk about in a little more detail the BAT FM, FM, that's frequency modulated areas, and, and how the, those are similar and different from uh, uh, consonant, uh, consonant vowel syllables uh, in a little more detail. And then finally, uh, for something completely different, we'll talk about uh, maps, uh, maps and attention in the visual and auditory, auditory system. Because um, when, you, when, you when you hear about maps, sometimes you, th you, th you think, well, if, if something has a map in it, it must not be involved in higher level uh, cognition. And that's, you shouldn't think that. And so we'll try to disabuse you of that, uh, of that notion when we talk about uh, attention. Okay, so starting off, uh, trading relations. So, so what are trading relations? So these, this is something that um, people who work in phonetics uh, came up with, looking at uh, how different cues can trade off with each other. So like, you know, you can add a little bit more of this cue and that will make up for a little less of this cue. And uh, it, when you're recognizing particular consonants uh, or vowels. And so, <clears throat> so one of the um, one of the modes of argument here was to say that uh, maybe this actually sort of argues for a, um, a speech-specific mode. So some some kind of processing in your brain that's that's specialized uh, for human speech that you wouldn't find in a in another animal that doesn't uh, doesn't process speech like we do. So. So let's look at, uh, like in this, in this particular, one particular case of trading, er, trading relations, this was actually worked out in some detail, what's actually causing it. And so it, it's interesting to sort of go through it. So for that, we have to do a tiny bit of phonetics. So what is, you know, what does um, phonetics look like if this is about two kilohertz? Let's look at a couple sounds. So if you make a bunch of sort of noise around two kilohertz, that's time, and that's uh, frequency going that way. That sort of sounds like a, a shh. So that, that, that's, that's what a, a, a shh sound is like. And if you make a little higher frequency, that's what a s, like an s, s sound uh, sounds like. Um, but what we're gonna talk about for trading relations are so those those are sort of continuous consonants that can sort of just, you can say s for a long time, but there's other consonants that have like a, a blockage. And an example would be uh, ch, like, uh, like choose. So that, so that sound uh, kind of starts off with a blockage. And it's very similar to a, to a sh sound. You just think like, like shoe and chew. Shoo, chew, shoo, chew. Your tongue is in a pretty similar position when you do those sounds. And so what distinguishes those sounds from each other? Uh, like if you just say uh, shoo, chew, you're starting you know, the, the word out with, with those two sounds and they're very clearly distinguishable. What, what's the difference between them? Well, the difference is that shoo just sort of starts up more slowly. So shoe looks like that. If we, if we plot the amplitude this way, so that's just how, how loud the sound is. So shoe is kind of like shoe sort of starts up. And uh, if you contrast that with, with chew, it just starts up a little faster. So this is, so this is, uh, phonetician uses different, 
symbol for this international phonetic a alphabet. Well, we'll just, uh, we'll just use this one. So this is, we'll just use English. So that's, that's chew versus shoe. So, so what phoneticians found was that if you, um, if you look at the amount of space of silence before shoe or chew, that can affect whether it sounds like a shoe or a chew. And so let's contrast two conditions here. So here's one condition where there's some, and this is the amplitude again, amp. So there's some, there's some sound going on, and then you got a little bit of a gap in silence, and then you, you have either a shoe or a chew. So, so, th so that would be a, a chew. Sorry, so that one should be dashed. And uh, so, th so this guy is, uh, so this guy is, uh, uh, this guy is uh, a chew, and this guy is a shoe. But now let's contrast that trading relation with another situation where we just have a, a little bit longer silence. We're not talking about a lot of, you know, a lot of a lot of time. We're, you know. 40, mill 40 milliseconds, so it's a small amount, you know, 20th of a second, 30th of a second, just a little tiny gap. Uh, so what if we just have a bigger gap and, say, make something like this sound, like that amplitude ramp? So, so what will that sound like? So, so it, it, in this case, this, this sounds like chew, and this, this sounds like shoe. Uh, but what does this sound like? Turns out this sounds like chew. And the reason is because you had a little bit of a bigger gap. And so phoneticians said, well, there's a trading relation, maybe a language-specific trading relation between this, this gap, which got bigger, and uh, the... Uh, and the rate of the amplitude ramp, you know, like, so, so you, can, you can use a, a less steep amplitude ramp, and that will make a good chew as long as you've got a little extra gap in time. And so, you know, in, at, at this scale, what would our shoe look like? You know, our shoe would look, you know, would look even, we could make do with an even slower, sort of slower start for a, uh, for a shoe. That's a shoe. So when people looked at this, uh, they, they looked at this in the, in the anesthetized cat auditory nerve. So obviously a cat is not an animal that has, uh, that has language uh, like we do. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't seem to understand, understand much language. Uh, but you can find the same phenomenon there. And so what's going on? So so what's going on is if you if you go into you know the auditory nerve so you you're basically recording from ganglion cells which are basically hooked up to uh, a single or a small number of hair cells and so the auditory nerve is it's just right at the very you couldn't get any lower than that in the auditory nerve so you record from the auditory nerve and what you find is uh this works there too. <laughs> and so what, what's going on? So what's, what's going on is we generally call this, you know, something like some horrible word like dishabituation. <laughs> so, so what happens in the auditory nerve is that you get habituation. So what is habituation is that if you make some noise for a while, uh, you get habituated to it. Now, we're not talking a long amount of time. We're talking like, you know, you make some noise for 50 milliseconds, and already after 50 milliseconds, 20th of a second, the auditory nerve is saying like, yeah, okay, I'm, I've heard that, and I'm not going to respond as good. But that dishabituation wears off very quickly. So all you need to do is add an additional 20 milliseconds or 10 milliseconds of silence, you know, at 50th of a second 
of extra silence here, right here. And that's enough to cause some dishabituation. And so then the auditory nerve will respond better. And so what is, why does that cause the trading relation? Well, then a, a ramp in amplitude that isn't as sharp as the original ramp that you would normally need if there was, if there was noise right before it will now give you a bigger response. And so, so the bottom line is here, the, the bottom line isn't that there are no higher level processes. The, the bottom line is that have an open mind about where these, where these things are going on. So this thing is already happening in the auditory nerve. It looks like a cognitive phenomenon related to sort of a language specific mode, but it's not. Uh, and there's other trading relations that are not implemented in the auditory nerve and they're implemented somewhere else. So, so that's, the, that's the important point. So you have some concept like trading relations uh, at a high level, but when you actually go down to the lower level, you know, sometimes it's due to something in the auditory nerve, sometimes it's due to something, something else. So it, it, kind of, it kind of devolves into multiple things at the lower level. So that's just sort of a cautionary, cautionary tale. So we uh, will sort of uh, finish, uh, finish with that one. And uh, so now let's talk about, uh, talk about uh, the BAT FM, FM areas. So, so these are areas that the, the BAT uses for figuring out how far away a prey item is. And so well, how, how does it do that? It basically, it basically measures the time difference between the frequency modulated part of its outgoing call and the frequency modulated part of the echo. So it just measures the, and it's not gonna be a big difference. You know, it's gonna be like five milliseconds or something like that, but there are neurons that, that can uh, detect this difference. And so what is, you know, so if you remember the, you know, so here's the, the bat brain, cerebellum, and olfactory nerve. And so we've got, we've got these areas, uh, areas on there. You've got like a big auditory cortex on there. And then there are these uh, two areas that we talked about that were next to it. And if we draw that bigger, you got the big auditory cortex with that acoustic fovea, which is caused by, it's caused by the gradient and stiffness of the, of the basilar membrane flattening out so that you have like a very high resolution part of the map there. And then as you go out to, to lower frequency, so this is low and high. And then you had sort of this 61 out to 63 kilohertz expanded acoustic fovea. We didn't talk about that area much at all. That was, you know, A1, that's the primary auditory cortex. Um, but there is another area uh, right alongside it. This is the CFCF -CF area. So this was, remember we had like C constant frequency one, constant frequency three. That was the one that was sort of like a vowel trying to distinguish trying to measure the Doppler shift between the frequency difference between these two bands of frequencies independent of, of where the actual, you know, where the actual frequency is. And that's sort of similar to a problem of recognizing a vowel spoken by different people with different sized vocal tracks. Because if, if I say an E, you know, my E frequency bands are like this. If a, if a small woman sa says an E, her frequency bands are going to be shifted up like that. But what makes it an E is the spacing between those frequency bands, not, not their actual exact frequency. And so that was the constant frequency part. But the part we're going to talk about today is this, is this part over the top called the FM, FM part. It's got a couple subdivisions in it, but you know, one of them is, uh, there's one here called FM1. FM3. So this is comparing the frequency modulated parts of the call. So this is C, 
CF1, CF3. This is FM1 dash FM3. Um, and so, what? So how were these experiments done? So these experiments were done with an anesthetized bat. Now, if you anesthetize a bat, it's not going to make any noise. Uh, and so, um, uh, so the way that these experiments are done is to actually generate a sound that is similar to the sound that the bat would make if it was actually ec echolocating. So you will artificially generate the outgoing sound, which the bat hears and goes into its auditory cortex and goes into this FM, FM area. Uh, and then you'll also generate an echo. And the echo will be a much softer sound uh, that, uh, that, that comes back off of, off of the bug. And so, so basically, there's the whole series of experiments. So, so what you can do, remember what our, our basic bat call looked like. It, it looked like uh, you had the first harmonic, frequency modulated, second harmonic, frequency modulated, third harmonic, frequency modulated, fourth harmonic, frequency modulated, and then you had a delayed shift, uh, frequency shifted echo coming back like that. So that, that's, that's our basic bat call. So this guy is the, is the echo, and this guy is outgoing. So if you go into this area, it's a very specific, it's got very specific requirements. So if you just play, if you just play the outgoing, like that, I'll just put three, make my drawing a little easier. So this is time and frequency going that way. So if you just play the outgoing, uh, frequency and time again. So no, it doesn't respond to that. Uh, if you just play the echo, it doesn't respond to that. So if you just play the echo, which is a much softer, softer thing, no. Uh, if we play both, you get you get a response from this from one of these neurons. So here's both uh, a, a delayed echo and an outgoing. So yes. Now you have to sort of like hone it down and see if we can sort of figure out, you know, what is further going on. So you could just play the outgoing and then the delayed echo, but just the constant frequency part. You know, so this is, we could label these. So this is, you know, outgoing. This is echo, uh, everything. Uh, this is CF only but including the echo, uh, and it doesn't respond to that. There's a delay in there, but it, it still doesn't respond to it. So, so then, um, then we can uh, just try um, just this frequency modulated part and just this frequency modulated part. So, so what is that? That's, that's just looking at just this sound and just that sound. And if you've got the delay correct, then you'll get a, uh, for this neuron, then you'll get a response. So yes. Uh, so this is, so what did we do? We did, you know, FM1 delayed FM3. Uh, but then you can fiddle around and, and, and show that, in fact, if you get the delay wrong, it won't work. So let, let's say we make a shorter delay. No. If we make the, the direction of the, of the ramp different, but the, the delay correct doesn't work. No. Uh, so... So this is, you know, wrong delay, delay, you know, wrong FM direction. So these neurons are very, very uh, specific. So they need specifically like a little frequency ramp 
and then a delay. So here's, you know, here's the here's the delay that we're talking about. You know, delay. You know, for example, uh, eight milliseconds, something like that. And it turns out there's a there's a map. You know, it goes from about one millisecond at this end out to like about say 14 milliseconds at this end. You know, there, there's an actual sort of map of delay as you as you go there. And so so that's the bat. So that's what the bat is doing. Uh, it's and and why do you have neurons so specific like this? Well, one thing you know, there's a lot of auditory junk in the world. And so if you're trying to figure out, there's other noises that are not coming from your echolocation. You know, the world is not completely quiet. So the, the animal is, is echolocating, but, you know, the trees are flapping and, the, and the, the, there's wind blowing and there's all these other different sounds going on at the same time. And so this is a very specific filter that picks up this very specific pattern of two different frequencies with a particular delay. Uh, so... So what's the relevant relevance to something like speech? Well, if you look at speech, speech is, speech is different than this. And so let's just look at a couple different, uh, uh, different uh, consonant vowel combinations. I'll just look at, at two different ones. So, so what if we do something like what is my first? So my first one is, I'll write it out with phonetic characters, B. So that's, that's the sound B. And then we want to get all the way to the sound boo. You can hear that boo is kind of a lower frequency. Uh, and then you got, you know, you got B. Um, B, uh, B. You know, ba, and ba, a couple other ones, uh, ba, that's ba, like bot, and then bo, and boo. Okay, so got all those, so what's the difference between those sounds? Those are different, all different vowels, same, same B. Uh, well, it, 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 if if you look at where the this so if you look at over time, where the spectrum starts from, it kind of the, the the sound kind of starts from a relatively low frequency, and then what happens is if you say B, uh, uh, your your tongue and mouth will you know it starts closed because when you at the very beginning of a B your mouth is closed. Uh, so, you, so you get a little sort of pattern like this, and it will, you know, and then it will resolve to a high frequency because your tongue is in a position, relatively high position, so it makes a small cavity. So it makes a eo, eo, eo. You can hear that if I go eo, 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 eo. It's, it's high, my tongue is going up for the e, and that makes the higher, higher frequency. And there's another formant, another formant, uh, which is you know coming here. But what happens if we do, you know, be, be, ba, ba, bo, bo, what, what's, what's going on there? Well, the frequency of the formants is, is, is kind of starting from the same position, but it goes a little lower for a, for a bay, and it keeps, it keeps going down uh, until, until basically for a boo, you're pretty much almost at your starting point. And so there'll be like uh, there'll be some little formant transitions here. So in order to recognize B, you've got to recognize like there's a particular spectrum at the beginning of B, and then there's a bend in that spectrum depending on what consonant comes, what, what vowel comes after it. And how would you compare this to say, like D day da da do do do, because those are all perfectly good. So what happens there is it, 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 look, it looks like you just start at a higher, at a, at a higher starting point. So you, you still end up at the same E sound. So here's the, you know, here's the D. 
but what what happens is uh, the format. If, if you do something like a do, uh, what, what happens is you actually kind of start start from up here and then go down. So, you, so the, the format transition actually is going the opposite direction, and there'll be another uh, there'll be another f uh, lower format here. So again, you know, if, if, as you go from D to day, which is a little lower frequency of that second second formant, you'll get something like that, etc. So it's more complicated. Uh, so I'm not I'm not trying to say that the bat situation is exactly the same, but you can see that what are the main things we're trying to pick up here? We're sort of trying to pick up the starting spectrum, and then it turns out you know this this little transition frequency modulated transition, the exact angle of it is very important for detecting uh, what the consonant is. And we can, uh, we, we, we can show with experiments that just playing that little transition part is, ha has enough information in it to tell you that it's like a, you know, like a, like a B or a, or a D. You can actually, you can actually distinguish uh, the ramp, you know, uh, the the ramp steepness of that and and the starting spectrum, so so the so the bottom line is we don't really know for the most part if you go into the human cortex what kind of uh, you know what kind of neurons we have in there and uh, you know what kind of processing mechanisms it's likely that we have a bunch of bat like frequency modulated pairs of frequency modulated or triples of frequency modulated sounds that are, uh, are uh, kind of specialized to pick up these different phonetic uh, contrasts so that we can you know, understand speech. Um, and so one of the things that the BAT literature is good for is it just gives you some idea of what you might want to look for. It's not going to be exactly the same because speech is not the exact same as trying to detect how far away a bug is. Uh, but some aspects of the signal are very similar. You've got some, cons you know, you've got some constant parts, CF parts that are like uh, vowels, and then you've got some rapidly changing parts that are like consonants. And the bat makes that very same distinction between its it, it, the constant frequency part of its call and the little frequency modulated part of its call. Okay, so that was um, that was. Bats and consonants and vowels in a little more detail to sort of fill in a little bit of the details that I went over uh, pretty quickly. Uh, quickly last time, we'll leave one little before I erase it. There's a do. There's a do. <laughs> uh, okay. So, so let's now completely change course and talk about um, talk about maps, uh, maps and attention. And so, so maps, so like I said at the beginning, when you first hear, oh, it, it's a map, then you might think, well, it must not be cognitive somehow. It must be, it's not doing truth and beauty. It's just doing like, you know, where things are in the world. Um, but it turns out that you know, a lot of the brain, a lot of the brain has, has maps in it, maybe about, in humans, about half, about 50, almost 50% of the cortex has some pretty straightforward maps in it. And so what, you know, what's going on in those maps? And, you know, it, what is, what is the map, what's being mapped? And at first, when we were talking about visual maps, we were talking about you know, maps that just map the retina. They just map different parts of the retina. So you have, you know, the retina just projects into the dorsolateral geniculate and makes a straightforward sort of nearest, you know, neighbor preserving map in the lateral geniculate. So how do we actually sort of investigate these maps at the level of functional MRI? And so we'll just sort of quickly summarize. So if we're doing a visual map, I'll do a visual uh, and an auditory, auditory map. 
So if you do a visual map, you have somebody fixate the center, extremely boring experiment, and then we, we make a little wedge like this and maybe put some uh, checkerboard in it that is sort of flashing back and forth, uh, like dark turns to light and light turns to dark. Uh, very irritating, but very effective for stimulating things. So it, it's, you could put faces in it or uh, other things, or uh, vacation photos, that, that'll work, work also. And so if you just take that thing and just rotate it around, slowly rotate it around, like once every minute, you know, like uh, you know, once uh, per minute, Uh, then what will happen is if you've got a, if you have some part of the brain that has a receptive field over there, then what's going to happen is uh, every once in a while, like once a minute, the area will become active beca because it will sweep by. And so if we, if we plot out just the, the response, so this is just the the response of the uh, of a voxel somewhere in the brain. So this is voxel response. And say this happened to be, you know, a voxel that corresponds to a part of the visual area that represents that part of the visual world. Then what's going to happen is, if we look at at that response, if this is this is time here. So here, here's zero. So it's not going to respond at the beginning. And then, and then after a delay of maybe 20 seconds, it will respond, and then it will it will stop responding until it waits until it gets around again, and that will respond, you know, again something like this. So you'll get a response that looks something like that. Now, what happens if instead we have another receptive field, say that's over here? So that receptive field is going to have a longer delay. So, so this guy, this guy corres corresponds to that signal. What's going to happen to this guy? Well, it'll look pretty much the same as the other one, except you know there's going to be a little bit longer delay before the response happens, something like that. So, so this guy goes there. Now, if we take that, <coughs> if we take that signal, that's a signal in time, and do a Fourier transform of it to figure out what frequencies are in it. Uh, so what do we get? So we do an FT. And what does an FT give you? It gives you two things. It gives you real and imaginary. Now, you, you might be thinking, well, that doesn't really help me, help me very much. So it gives you real and imaginary. It gives you a complex valued signal. Uh, real and imaginary. It's now a function of frequency. So this guy was a. Fre so here we had time going that way. Now we got frequency going that way. And usually we don't look at that real and imaginary picture. What we almost always do is we. If this is the. It, it represent a, re represents a vector, and here's the real and the imaginary part of that. It's kind of like the x and y component of the vector. Usually what we do is we convert that to a phase angle and an amplitude. <clears throat> so we can just take that Fourier transform data and just convert it to uh, frequency and amplitude. And what do you get? Well, <clears throat> uh, sorry, phase and amplitude. So, so here's the amplitude. And what you're going to see if you put in a signal like this is you'll see however many cycles there were. Say there were, you know, say there were eight, you went around eight times. So what th there ought to be a big signal at eight. I didn't make it eight, so what did I make it? One, two, three, four, five. A big signal at five. That's a frequency of five because it went, it, <coughs> you got five bumps in it. Um, and then... But you also get the phase angle, and the phase angle is basically the delay. Uh, and so, so there'll be a particular, at that frequency, there'll be a particular phase angle. What is this phase angle? Well, 
in this case, the phase angle should be about, you know, 135, something like that. So say, so say that's 135 degrees uh, phase angle. And so if you see a signal like that, where there's a, a, a big peak because there were five bumps and not too many other frequencies, and then we, we extract out the phase angle, then we can tell where we are in the map. So, so that's basically how these mapping experiments work. So they, they collect some you know, real data, and then you do a Fourier transform of it here, and then we convert that to um, amplitude and phase, and then um, <coughs> look, at the, look at the phase angle, and that tells us the delay. Delay, and that tells us the position. in visual field. That's our, that's our goal. And so then now we can do that at each voxel and then we can come up with a, <coughs> come up with a visual map or multiple visual maps. So when you first, so that sort of seems, you know, that's very, it's very sort of intuitive. You're just trying to sort of figure out what the layout of the map of of polar angle. Uh, this doesn't tell you how far away it is from the center. It just tells you what the what angle it is relative to the center. Um, and so, at first, you might think, well, that's just this kind of a low-level map. It's something like the like the like the geniculate. Uh, and uh, but it turns out um, <clears throat> it's a little more complicated than that. It, it's, it's actually in most areas in the cortex, it's actually not really a map of what's out there. It's, it's rather a map of what you're attending to. Now, if you look at this stimulus, if the background is black and there's only one little wedge there, well, obviously you're attending to that thing because that's all there is. But we could do a different experiment. So, so this, is, this is our stim. So instead of that stim, let's do a different a different stem. And this different stem is, let's put wedges all over the place. <laughs> so we got a wedge here, and a wedge here, and a wedge here, and a wedge here. So like just fill the whole mess up with a bunch of wedges. And they've, um, <clears throat> they've all got, you know, they've all got flashing checkerboards. It's just like a total, total mess. And this is closer to like what, what happens in the real world. Uh, you know, you've got there's junk all over the place. It's stuff's moving in different directions. Uh, it's just a normal sort of confusing mess. That's, that's more like the real world. Now what you do is <coughs> you just say, oh, and, then, and then rotate it. Rotate that, that, rotate that mess. So rotate the whole mess. Now you have the subject just pay attention to one of the wedges. And how could we do that? We could sort of do it like we did it with the with the monkeys. You could say, you know, put, sometimes put a face in that wedge, sometimes put a face in this wedge, but they're only supposed to respond. Ignore the faces that are in that wedge and just just respond to this. Just respond to this. So, so basically, just attend to one wedge. Just like we defined it in the monkey case, which was just respond when something appears in that one wedge. Attend to events only in this wedge as it moves. So what's the actual stimulus? Well, it's covering the entire visual field all the time. <clears throat> what happens when we, when we do this kind of analysis? Uh, it looks just like a single wedge. <laughs> So maps look just like single wedge at, that, at, at a particular angle, at whatever angle wedge you were, you were picking. And so, <coughs> uh, except for V1, so, you know, except for V1. So V1 is the only area uh, straight cortex is the only area that really tells you what's out there. Like if V1 is, 
you know, <clears throat> V1 is not very susceptible to attention. V1 says, like, you know, if I'm going to respond, there's actually something out there. But all the other areas, all the other 40 areas, <laughs> uh, look just like they were seeing a single wedge. And so, so what's, you know, what's the implication? Well, the implication is that this is basically these maps that we're seeing uh, are basically, you know, attention otopy. They're, they're actually sort of, they're maps of attention. They're not really maps of, um, they're not really maps of just location. They're, they're maps of what you're attending to, because if you actually fill the entire visual field with junk, uh, then uh, the maps look exactly the same way, because what they're really representing is where is your visual attention located? Uh, and so it shows that <clears throat> even though you, you might at first think that maps are a very low-level thing, just, you know, applies to the retina and the lateral geniculate, in fact, they go up and cover like about half of the cortex and are very important for, uh, for all different kinds of higher-level processing. You have maps and areas that are doing complicated recognition of object relations and complicated motions and all, all stuff like that. Okay, so that was the... <clears throat> That was the visual warm-up. So, so now let's, uh, let's talk about, let's try to do the same thing in the auditory system. So, so how would you map the auditory system? Um, first, you've got to deal with, you know, auditory in the scanner. <laughs> uh, in scanner. Scanner makes a lot of noise. And so one thing you can do is you can, <clears throat> if you put somebody in the scanner, there's a happy person in the scanner. And you put some special headphones on him that have a little microphone in the headphone. So, so if, we put a little, uh, if we put a little microphone in there, like so here's a mic, so we can hear what noise is coming into the headphone. Uh, and then here's the actual sort of driver this is actually a, a piezoelectric driver. That's a kind of thing that can make noise in the magnet without getting interfered with, without the magnetic field uh, interfering with it. <clears throat> you put some current through a piezoelectric device and it will move, but the magnetic field won't mess with it. And it, it won't mess with the magnetic field. And so then if we record the sound that's coming in there, uh, we can just record the sound that's coming in there, and there's like a very really loud sound coming in. Every time the scanner beeps, it's going beep, 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 beep. And so each one of those beeps is a very loud noise. We can record that. And then what we can do, so, you know, here's what's coming out of the mic. Uh, then what we can do is we can feed the negative of that. So feed the negative of that back into the signal along with our, our real signal. So here's our real, sig real signal that we want to actually play, but we will we'll feed the negative, uh, you know, of the noise uh, into the, into the mic. And so that will, that will cancel out some of the, uh, some of the noise that uh, the scanner makes. It's not perfect because noise gets in through your body and sound waves that the scanner makes go into your body and then they go in through your body up into your ear. So you can't stop that. So there's, you're still going to hear some sound because you know, your body's picking up sound waves and they're propagating inside your body. Uh, but it gets rid of some of it. <clears throat> and so, so then um, what we can do is present something that's the equivalent of this uh, uh, situation here. And so, so what's the equivalent of that situation? Well, the equivalent of that situation would be, so that's, um, we'll call that, you know, A. And here's B. So the equivalent of that situation would be to play um, ramps of frequency. So this is frequency here and time. And so we would do something like this. So why does it go up like that? So the reason it goes up like that is because we know if we go into the, into the auditory system that we have an approximately... Uh, so if we look at A1, we have an approximately logarithmic representation. What does that mean? That means like if we look at where 100 hertz is represented, 
And then we look at where 200 hertz is represented. So we doubled the frequency and we moved on the cortex. But if you double 200, it doesn't, it doesn't go... It, so, so 400 appears here, and then 800 appears here. So every time you double the frequency, it just makes it sound like it goes up. So if you go, duh, duh, that's double the frequency. Duh, that's like <coughs> quadruple the frequency. But those sort of sound equally far apart, like duh, duh, duh. Those sound like three sounds. That could be like about, about 100, 200, and then 400. So because you've got this, <coughs> this logarithmic, you know, approximately log map, you know, versus frequency. Uh, if you want to make a, uh, if you want to make a wave of activity move across the auditory cortex at equal speed, you've got to uh, you have to sort of exponentially increase the frequency. So we'll start off with lower frequency and then sort of go up, up, up a little bit, you know, faster like that, and then go back at the beginning and then you know slowly and then go up faster again, just like that. So. So, that, so that's going to be the equivalent. That's going to cause, cause a wave of activity to go across this auditory cortex. And we can do the same thing here, figure out what the delay is. Um, and then we can, uh, we can get, we can get an, an auditory map, a map of frequency. Now, typically, we, you, know, you, might use, you might not use just one frequency. You could use, you could use multiple frequencies, like a, like a whooshing sound, like... So if you, you know, if you make a bunch of lower frequencies, you'll get something that sort of sounds like. If you make middle frequencies, it'll go up, and higher frequencies, so it, it would be sound something like like. Until you get up to the higher frequencies. So, you play that in there, uh, you'll find auditory maps, but we can do the equivalent of this experiment. And so the equivalent of that experiment is <clears throat> why don't we put a bunch of frequencies in there at the same time. And I compare this to, you know, musical transcription. So if you're, if there's a pop tune and you want to sort of like learn how to play the pop tune, you sort of listen to the, listen to the tune. First you listen to the bass. Now that it's got a bunch of frequencies in it. You listen to the bass, try to figure out what the bass is doing. Then you listen to the guitar, figure out what that's trying to do. And then you listen to the voice or the melody, try to figure out what that's doing. Then you listen to where the drums are. You sort of focus your auditory attention on different frequencies. And so we can do that in the magnet. And so what we do is let's put like a little, a little melody going down here at this frequency. And let's put some other melody going over here. It's going up and down and another melody like this, and another melody like this. And so you've got all different sorts of frequencies going on at the same time. But then what you do is you say to the subject, it helps if you have like somebody who's good at transcription, <laughs> just pay attention to this melody. Okay, and now just pay attention to this melody. Now just pay attention to this one. Now just pay attention to this one. And so, what you're doing is you're, you're causing the, the person's attention to sort of go up in frequency. And then back to paying attention to this one, back to paying attention to this one, back to paying attention to this one, back to et cetera. So, so basically you're sweeping the person's attention in frequency, sort of similar, similar to this, but <clears throat> you've got all frequencies there all at the same time. And so... Um, so what happens? Uh, it turns out all auditory maps uh, look like single frequency sweeps. So all the higher, so they basically just look like the same thing as this. So once again, you have um, uh, you have 
attention atopy. It's, and what is this? Like frequency, at frequency atopy. So what you're doing is you're paying attention to a particular frequency band, which corresponds to a particular part of your map, but the whole map is being stimulated at the same time. And so what, what's, what you're doing is you're, you're kind of stomping down the signals coming from the other parts of the map and just focusing your attention on one frequency band. And this is present in, in many, different, uh, many different auditory areas. Okay, so for the last few minutes, I'll just talk about an experiment which I did once. It's a great experiment. should really do it again. Um, but um, this is a missing fundamental experiment. Okay, this is a very, very cool missing fundamental experiment. And if I don't do it again, one of you guys should do it. Yeah, missing fundamental mapping. So we talked about, uh, in one of the uh, other advanced sessions, we talked about what, are, what, what do sounds you know, actually look like? Well, they look like they typically have harmonics. So if you have a 100 hertz sound, it's typically going to be, if it's coming out of a, you know, a, an instrument or a guitar or a voice, it's typically going to have like you know, 200 in there and 300 and 400 and 500, 600, 700, 800. It'll have integer spacing frequencies. And so what do those, you know, what do those look like on the cortex? Well, they look like th there'll be some 100 hertz, and then there'll be some 200 hertz, second harmonic, and then there'll be some 300 hertz, and, and 400 hertz, and 500 hertz. They'll get closer together on the cortex as you go up. So I'll say that's 100, 200, you know, say that's 300 there. So that's what a sound actually looks like. It's, it's, it spreads out, in, spreads out in frequency, and... A different sound, say, you know, 150, is going to look like, you know, start here, and it's going to have a bunch of harmonics uh, that are going to spread out but be slightly higher. So that's, you know, these are, you know, sound plus harmonics. You know, sound um, harmonic one, harmonic number one, um, plus higher harmonics. So what we can do is we can set up a <coughs> we can set up a sound that contains um, just the higher harmonics, but leaves out the fundamental. So so what we do is we say like for a, a hundred, uh, our stim. So this is you know in the cortex. Our stem will consist of uh, just not a hundred, so leave out a hundred, but just put in, say, you know, two hundred. Uh, say leave out three hundred, you know, put in four hundred and, and five hundred, and say seven hundred. So, so there's a hundred. Leave that out, you know, put in two hundred, you know, three hundred, uh, four hundred, and seven hundred. So what does that sound like? That sounds like a hundred. Th this this whole mess sounds like a hundred. Now we can um, slowly ramp the missing fundamental by using different combinations of higher harmonics. So basically, ramp missing fundamental. Um, using using patterns of higher harmonics but under the special condition um, you know with the uh, same overall spectrum so that we don't change the so we don't change the so basically what we could do is for 100, we do 200, 300, 400, 700. For 150, we might choose some slightly lower harmonics so that we end up with the same overall spectrum of our stimulus at all times, but the fundamental is sweeping. So this would be sort of m basically mapping pitch, so making a slow, a slow ramp in pitch, but not 
making a ramp in frequency at all because the frequency of all these higher harmonics will be chosen so that on average they just average out to the same same frequency so we shouldn't see any straightforward frequency map we should just see a map of having done the computation to figure out what the missing fundamental is and then like actually mapping that missing fundamental mapping the pitch and so so we did this did this once and and we got a map of pitch and approximately uh, where it is, it, uh, it more or less is where you'd expect it. Um, it's like somewhere about, about here. And we know that if you look at the auditory system, you can see that, you know, uh, there's, it's more or less, if this is primary cortex, it's more or less divided up into sort of a what pathway and then a where pathway that sort of heads, heads back here a little bit like that. So this is, you know, more like where or you know how pathway you could call it how pathway sort of similar to the visual system where you've got like sort of attention and manipulation of objects uh, up here but you got sort of object prop uh, object sort of identity you know like which face is it down here so you kind of have a what and a where in the auditory system and in the what you know a pitch is kind of a, a what a what kind of thing so, so someday we'll uh, maybe do that experiment uh, enough times to make people believe it, but uh, that, that's an example of a higher level experiment looking at something like pitch uh, that you can do that um, sort of uses some of these methods of, of looking for maps. Okay, Stan, I think uh, I'm done there just in time.